Marley, welcome to Livewire. Uh, for our radio listeners who can't see what we're doing, we're also being joined by uh, Jack Jason, who is Marley's longtime business partner and interpreter. Uh, Marley, congrats on all the love this film is getting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, everyone who's listening, um, except for the deaf people who can't hear us. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> no, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you. It's really exciting, and it's an exciting time. About time. Uh, I understand you were one of the first people cast in this film. Uh, did they actually write this film with you in mind somewhat? Uh, it wasn't written for me, actually. I just got lucky in that I got the script on time because it was such a good script, such a good role, such a good story. The dynamics of the film were so amazing that I, as soon as I read it, I told my team, you know, get on board right away, <laughs> grab this, because there are so many good and talented actors out there, but I wanted to be the front of the line. So <laughs> I, I really really wanted to do it. I wanted it so badly. So uh, I was fortunate that I was able to get the film part and I was able to do the film. Awesome. Uh, I thought it was interesting that your character, uh, who is uh, the mother in a, a family where the mother and father are deaf and one of their children is deaf. Um, I don't know how to put this delicately. She's not the greatest mom. <laughs> <laughs> like she's, let's just say this, she's complicated. Was that part of the attraction to the role? Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a mom of four, and I know how difficult it is. Jackie and myself as mothers, we share similar uh, – we have strong maternal instincts, if you want to put it that mm. way. So it's just that we approach it a different way. I mean, she had a different experience than I did growing up. Jackie did. Um, between myself and Jackie uh, as a character, I would say she was not a good mom. Mm. Um, she's just a different kind of mom in that – she wasn't. Uh, she didn't have the opportunity to experience music. She didn't have uh, experience. I mean, after she was, you know, she left her home, which was all hearing, and now she married a deaf man, and so she probably found the hearing world a little bit daunting for her. And she chose not to integrate herself into the community because of the way she was raised. Uh, she was pretty much uh, a loner. Um, she was treated only. Uh, as a beauty object and not the way she should have. Uh, that's what I tried to imagine who she was. And she was always praised for her beauty, praised as a young girl who was beautiful. And, and she eventually became a beauty queen. And that's all she felt she got mm -hmm. from her family who, you know, didn't quite know how to communicate with a girl who was deaf. So because of that, she probably made sure when she became a mom that she would have uh, a, a different approach, and she hoped that it would be uh, with communication in the languages she's comfortable with, because she married a deaf man, she had a deaf son, but then what happened was she got a hearing daughter, mm. <laughs> and so, listen, she loves her daughter, she doesn't love her daughter, she doesn't love her daughter any differently or less than her son, but her perspective was probably different as a result of the fact that she's hearing. Mm -hmm. There's a really poignant moment in the film where your character... Uh, sort of levels with her daughter who's hearing and says, I was sort of hoping you would be deaf um, so that we could have a closer relationship or what she thought might be a closer relationship. Um, as a person who was deaf in a hearing family, Marley, I'm curious what your relationship with your parents was like. Um, my upbringing was different because my family was extremely supportive in that uh, from day one, when they found out that I was deaf at 18 months, uh, that I was profoundly deaf, they, well, naturally they were devastated. They didn't know, they'd never even seen or met deaf children mm. before. So what they did initially is they did their homework and they consulted and made sure that I got professional assistance. And, but at the same time, wanted to treat me with love and respect just as any child would, whether deaf or hearing. It's just that there were different accommodations in my life compared to probably what Jackie got in her life. Um, my barriers were much different than hers. Uh, but in my case, we overcame them because of the support of my uh, parents and my family. Mm, I understand that, yeah, your parents all learned ASL and your family uh, really did what they could to sort of support you and, and be able to have a fluid communication. I 
wouldn't say that they were fluent in mm. ASL. I became fluent at lip reading. Okay. <laughs> and I then matched that up with their ASL as best they could. I mean, it would have been nice if they were more fluent, but naturally I didn't even think that way when I was growing up. Mm. I I didn't I didn't have the sense of why don't you sign better <laughs> as well as I do. I didn't have that sense from them. Mm. I just was a kid who was fiercely independent mm. and I was extremely curious and I was always yes, asking questions as opposed to wallowing in, in, in self doubt. I mean, I was busy exploring. I was busy making friends. I, I was out there doing so many things that um, my parents and my two brothers gave me a foundation that I could be independent like that. They gave me the opportunity to, to grow up and to, learn and to fall down sometimes when you do and but to just get right back up again they were it was a i mean i had great schools too i mean we had deaf education programs in our hearing schools they're called mainstream schools mm -hmm. and i was fortunate that chicago area schools were probably one of the best schools in the nation for this did i hear right that you approached henry winkler when you were like 12 and the, the Fonz for people who have forgotten and told him that you wanted to be an actor. And then years later, you end up being an Oscar winning actor and you're like crashing at his house with his wife. <laughs> That's absolutely right. So what happened was, is he came to visit us in Chicago. He was there for a charity event and I happened to be working and performing at the center on deafness. That's where I sort of, well, it's where I began my acting career. And they invited Henry and his wife, Stacy to watch us perform at the center. And naturally, I knew who he was because I loved Happy Days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I made this plan in my head that I would, you know, I had an agenda that I would, you know, I wasn't, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to, to talk to him and ask him if it was okay to be an actor in Hollywood, just like him which I did. <laughs> and he naturally said, you know, Marley, uh, I mean, it's, oh, listen, as, about, as he was about to give me advice, um, someone took Henry aside and said, Henry, don't encourage Marley too much to answer, you know, with the question, because you know how tough it is for hearing people in this industry. I can't imagine what it'd be like mm -hmm. for deaf people mm -hmm. and she might get disappointed. But Henry, you know, he just nodded his head and, uh, you know, well, that person didn't realize that Henry had his own barriers growing up. And uh, he turned around and looked me in the eye and said, Marley, sweetheart, you can be whatever you want to be as long as you set your heart to it and follow your dreams and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And I listened to that. And eight and a half years later, I was standing on a stage with an Oscar. Cool. But <laughs> as it so happened, as it so happened, the Fonz for the win. I had. <laughs> Wait, say that again. The Fonz. Say that again. The Fonz for the win. <laughs> he did. <laughs> Absolutely, it's all on. It's all. It's all his fault that I got that Oscar. But anyway. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> so what happened was, is that after I got the Oscar and and I, I didn't know quite where to go with my career, there were critics who said. For example, Rex Reed, who hmm. said that uh, just the day after I won the Oscar, that my win the night before was the result of a pity vote. Yeah. Wow. And he said that I was a deaf actor playing a deaf role. So how was that considered acting or even the best? Ugh. And I think if I had understood what he was trying to say at the time, I probably would have said something in response. Well, what do you mean? So does that mean that when hearing actors play hearing roles, they don't deserve <laughs> right. Oscars too? Right. What, what are you trying to say? So what happened was because of that, that critic, that, that, that critique, I really, I mean, it was hard to understand where to go with my career. And I was just 21 and I was still in the process of growing. So, and I had just gotten sober too at the same time. Mm. Uh, so I flew out to California and I knocked on his door. I mean, they knew I was coming. I mean, I mean, I didn't surprise them. But uh, when I when he opened the door, I held up my Oscar. I was so shy, and I just turned my head and said, "Here, here's my Oscar." And they had the <laughs> biggest they had the biggest smiles on their face. <laughs> and then Henry knew what had been said in the press, and he said the same thing again. You know, Marley, you can be whatever you want to be, as long as you believe in yourself. But you're not finished, not by a long shot. Mm. And so Stacy and Henry said, "You know what? Why don't you stay for the weekend for a couple of days?" And we can think it over. 
And then two years later, Stacy was telling me to clean my room because it was a guest who never left. I mean, I had a pool house. Uh, the rent was free. And Stacy made the best brisket west of Chicago. And their support was critical in my career. It was, it was very much needed, very much appreciated. And to this day, after knowing them for 40 years, I still thank them. Oh, wow. wow. This is Live Wire Radio. We are talking to Marley Matlin about uh, her career and also her new film, Coda, which is out on Apple TV right now. We have to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with more with Marley Matlin here on Live Wire. Stay with us. Welcome back to Livewire from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello and Marley Matlin, the uh, Oscar-winning actor and uh, cast member in the new film Coda, which won the Sundance uh, Grand Jury Prize uh, recently. It's on Apple TV right now. Um, it's sort of a well-known thing about this film, Marley, that after you were cast, there had been a plan to cast hearing actors in the roles of your husband and son who uh, are deaf in the film, and you were not having that. Were you really ready to walk away from the film if they were gonna go forward with that plan? Well, I mean, I had the opportunity to be in this business for 35 years, and I've had the chance to see this happen where uh, a lot were, was good about films that I was in and a lot that wasn't. And not to, to denigrate or, you know, say something bad about the industry, I think they're on a learning curve and mm. whether they, you know, whether I just left alone or decided to walk away, I think when it came to casting, I guess as I got older, I have had enough. I've mm. seen too many times when hearing actors play deaf characters as if they were costumes you could put on and take off at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. mm. I, I just said I was tired of it. I really was. And I, I really just said that was enough. So I felt comfortable in saying and making noise because I, I didn't want to do this alone. And there are a lot of great actors out there who are deaf or who have a disability that can make noise just like I can. We are talking about authenticity, how important it is. And again, not to, not to say something bad about actors who have played disability roles in the past, um, like um, Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man. Um, or, or the many others. I mean, listen, I'm a fan of all their work, so there's no, there's no offense here. But I think it's time that we move on from that. And if we want to tell good stories and we want to have authentic actors playing the roles who live with disability, who live with being deaf, you get a more authentic portrayal. You get a more realistic portrayal. I mean, how do they think it's okay? Mm -hmm. Again, we are not costumes. We are people. And I think it's possible that uh, if you can find a bigger name that's that's well known and that can play Frank, well then go for it. I'm not gonna be part of it. Mm -hmm. I had to say, stop, you know, I love this film. I love the script. I love Sean Hader, the director and her vision, her work. And I really love the character of Jackie. And I can't even imagine playing this role of somebody who is hearing playing deaf. It just wouldn't work. It, it, it just wouldn't work for the film. It wouldn't work for the deaf community. It wouldn't work for everybody involved. You wouldn't have gotten a, a realistic portrayal. Mm. And I said, I'd walk away. I'd say I'd walk away. And I wasn't angry. It was just time for me to make my point and speak out. And, and I was nervous. Admittedly, I was nervous uh, because I could have been easily, you know, dismissed. But yet I knew deep down that people would eventually understand. They would get it. Yeah. And they would understand what the point I was trying to make, why it was so critical to have this role played authentically. This film, it's so funny. Mm -hmm. And still, I cried mm. through the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I finished watching it about an hour ago and I was like putting like cold compresses under my eyes before the Zoom. And I think the reason for that is that it, it was just so real. You guys seemed like a total family. And I'm just so curious how you made that happen, how you made four very different actors bond and make such an identifiable family mm. so quickly well because we're really actors we're really <laughs> actors we are great actors we <laughs> yeah. get the story we get the characters we get everything and it's our culture and it's our language and that's why this work that's why we all work together well I, again it, it, if you had Two, you know, that person and a hearing person just wouldn't work. Mm. Uh, we, I get playing roles when it comes to, I mean, I'm not going to play a different race. I'm not going to play 
a different disability, it, we're talking about a whole different ball game. And working with this cast, Troy and Daniel and Amelia was just oh. uh, brilliant. I mean, we got along instantly, just like that. We didn't even have enough time to get to know each other. We, I mean, we were all friends, except for Amelia. Huh. Uh, we all knew each other before. And when w- Amelia came into the picture, we welcomed her with open arms. I mean, she was a pro. I mean, she yeah. was 17 years old. She was British. She had to have an American accent. She had to learn American Sign Language. She had to learn how to be a CODA. She had, which, you know, CODA, again, is not a disability. You want to make sure. If we're talking about hearing CODAs um, without any disabilities, then certainly she's she's not like the same situation that we are when we're, you know, somebody hearing playing deaf. And she had to learn how to fish. And she had to learn how to interpret <laughs> all at That's 17 years old. So I have to say she was golden. She was yeah. golden in this role. And Troy and Daniel, as for them, I mean, it was such a pleasure to work for them. The fact that um, Troy was on my bucket list of actors to work with, I finally had the opportunity to check that off. He's amazing. And Sean Hader, I mean, she brought us all together. I don't know if you guys have seen her film Tallulah. It's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. So she really came to the table very talented. Uh, Speaking of uh, your daughter, Ruby, in the film, uh, she is an amazing singer in the film, uh, which your character has a sort of a hard time relating to uh, because of uh, being deaf. I'm curious, though, uh, Marley Matlin, in real life, what is your relationship with music? I know you like Billy Joel and you were on Dancing with the Stars. So it sounds like <laughs> you're pretty into music. I love music. I love music. I have two older I had two older brothers who, uh, you know, were raised in the 60s and they were true hippies and they really got into music. They introduced me to Billy Joel and to James Taylor. Mm. And I learned to hear with my eyes and I learned the lyrics and I listened with my hearing aids and I learned the songs and I enjoy music. I enjoy music in my own way, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there are people out there who are deaf who really love music. Some even um, are um, singers. There's a guy by the name of Sean Forbes. He's a deaf rapper. You should look him up. Um, He's based in Detroit and there are plenty of other people who are deaf who like music. Um, Mandy Harvey, who is deaf, who was on America's Got Talent. Mm. She's deaf and she sings. So uh, being on Dancing with the Stars was just a challenge for me. And my kids wanted me to be on the show <laughs> when they asked. I mean, I didn't really know much about the show when I was first asked. But my kids said, Mom, you got to do the show. But yeah, when I go to my kids' school concerts and they have recitals or plays or musicals, I'll go with my husband and my husband's hearing and I'll watch and I sit there and, and I try to enjoy it as best as I can in my own way. And I'll check out the other parents who are taking pictures and who are smiling and applauding, but it's just different than the way hearing people look or see concerts clearly. So I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to, I mean, I'm very proud of my kids who are up there singing and as far as Jackie goes and Frank, they just come from a different world Mm -hmm. and they were thrust in this, unexpectedly and the whole movie is about them learning as they go along all the whole family just growing and uh, that's how it is in getting ready to talk to you marley i uh, i watched a lot of your work and i read a lot of interviews with you and it struck me that there is no time when you are ever getting to take a break from talking about deafness is that exhausting at some point? I mean, would you, like, is there a different topic that you want to talk about, like the Chicago Bears or something? No, the more we talk about it, the more we talk about it, the more that people will listen and mm-hmm. learn and just spread the message. So why not? It's how you make things happen. It's how you make things work. It's, I mean, it, it's about collaboration. It's the key. I can't be angry. I can't not want to talk about it because there's not enough people out there who are still not familiar with uh, deaf culture. If if people weren't familiar, I mean, clearly, I, I, I just have to keep talking. If they, if they were all familiar, then I wouldn't have to say anything mm-hmm. anymore about it. But um, I, I just find that it's important to talk about the barriers, walk around the barriers. That's what Henry taught me. Mm-hmm. Uh, this film is just getting so much love critically and, uh, of course, at Sundance. And I mean, I don't know. I guess uh, could you win another Oscar just to stick it to Rex Reed? <laughs> <laughs> well, you said it. Stick it. I'm. I'm, I'm not going to say stick it. I can smile at that, though. I can smile in agreement. <laughs> well, best of luck and really great job on the film. Uh, this it was just really incredible and and really heartwarming and funny. Uh, yes. Marley Matlin. The uh, film is Coda. It's on Apple TV right now and in select theaters. Thanks so much for coming on Livewire. And Jack, thank you so much as well. 